Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. And hey, I'm super excited today because I am joined by Alex T from Black Oath Entertainment. Alex, how are you? Hey Daniel, I'm I'm doing great. Finally, Excellent. finally here with you. Very happy. Yeah, yeah, I know. We've been uh, th we've been threatening to do this for, <laughs> for quite a, for while, a long at time. Least, at least a year, I think. The first time we started, I think we should have a conversation online. And yeah. <laughs> Hey, I'm so very excited for, to be here. For those of you who maybe don't know who you are or don't know what Black Oath Entertainment is, uh, give us give us the uh, the elevator pitch of Black Oath Entertainment. Yeah, so I'm the person behind Black Oath Entertainment, and and I focus mostly on on solo stuff, generally darker themes because that's my that's what I personally prefer as a player. <laughs> But uh, I well I I do some other stuff, but yeah, the focus is soul level and GMless content, uh, RPGs, uh, some some other little games which I don't fully consider proper RPGs, but yeah, that that kind of tabletop stuff. Yeah. So um, so let's see. We're going to we're going to talk through a bunch of your games today, and just like I have a stack of of books here, and we're just going to kind of go through one by one, talk a little bit about each, but um. Before we do that, you uh, said that you you are focused kind of on solo play, and a lot of your books do have solo and GM play. But um, are you kind of always thinking of solo play in mind? Is that always something in mind when when you're designing most of your yeah. stuff? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean the the only exception to the rule will be kind of sacrifice the first release, which didn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was very solo friendly because I just can't help it. My my goal with sacrifice was to try to make something OSR-ish and and very fast. I wrote it in a month, so it was very very fast. Uh, put it together very very quickly, and that meant leaving out solo rules, which usually imply a little bit more of dedication. And I, I know you know the the type of gameplay that a solo player is a bit that a solo player demands is a bit more. Um, well, at least how I like it to make, how I prefer to make it is a little bit more detailed and demands a set of rules and tools that a GM doesn't need, even though yeah. it makes a GM's life easier, of course. So yeah, Sacrifice originally was probably the the only game I've written that wasn't fully soluble, but immediately after, like literally, literally the month yeah. after I released Solo Rules. So yeah, I fixed it. And now the, the version available for purchase, which is the branded edition, comes with the solo rules with all the solo it, rules. And yeah so everything everything i have is, is soloable from the get-go now is that did you like is your history in gaming have you always gravitated towards solo play um not really actually i, I mean i've been playing games since always my I, literally always my father was playing battle tech and things like that in the mm -hmm. early 90s and war games and all this stuff so yeah i, I grew up watching that stuff and and playing it myself but uh, i just didn't know you could play solo games until i had to <laughs> when i ended up without <laughs> without a group without so people my, to play with yeah yeah so, <laughs> so so my first um my first instinct was i guess like you uh, go towards tabletop uh, board games yeah because yeah because realized... you, you have yeah more or i was kind of surprised by your kind of extensive love for for board games yeah, yes, yeah, they're yeah. they're they an absolute passion of of mine, and and that's how I got into solo solo stuff, solo gaming, mm -hmm. um, because I discovered um, that you could actually play board games alone, which was like mind blowing for me. <laughs> yeah. It was absolutely amazing, and then that slowly took me to uh, what I call RPG light games, like um, or Against Darkness or the One Hundred Dungeon. Right. And and from there I realized like damn I can actually play RPGs alone when I discovered Mythic. And well from there I was like, okay, I, I had to I have to jump into this. This is very cool. Yeah, I'm sure you're a lot like me where even the, the, the board games that I have always gravitated to over my life have been kind of RPG adjacent. Yeah. You know, even back in the day with something like simple like Talisman. Yeah. Just, it always gave me that feel of okay, I'm yeah, kind of playing Hero D &D. Quest, of course. Hero Quest, yeah. You're yeah. getting the you're you're scratching a similar itch with yes. like a character and 
and and spells and 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 weapons and fighting yeah, monsters yeah. and getting experience points and um Definitely. yeah it's like the uh, so many of the board games i like are already rpg adjacent so yeah it does make sense to kind of eventually combine those two things together yeah, it was it was in inevitable <laughs> so why haven't we seen a black oath entertainment board game <laughs> well it's not because of lack of of wanting it's just more logistics things it's yeah. just uh it's a higher investment it's it's just more complicated and yes i mean i guess i could and i thought about maybe doing it through the game craft or something like this but i don't know you could say that um Kernethalas is going to be my first pseudo uh tabletop uh, game board game because i'm adding the thanks to the campaign we're adding the all the stretch goals which is cards and with the cards that's the new that's the new kind of dungeon survival game yeah right? that's the latest yeah. kickstarter yeah yep so yeah thanks to we unlock the cards all the it's almost a thousand cards is so, it really yeah oh wow so before we started recording i was just telling alex that when, when i back something which i backed that and uh say, say the name again because i forgot it Karenathalas. Karenathalas. and that's yeah. kind of like that's the name of the of the land right it's it's the it's the area you're the necropolis yeah. you're exploring yeah 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 or and also, also called the midnight throne right so i back something i back and, for, and forget like i don't follow so i'm always surprised when things arrive with all these stretch goals that i didn't know so man i would have been <laughs> i would have thought i was getting some little book and then it comes with like a thousand cards <laughs> yeah I'm, well it, it's going to be pod so uh-huh i'm i'm delivering them through drive through rpg to drive through so, nice yeah yep. so yeah well i mean backers will still have to pay the the cost of the deck and the shipping but it's it's I the mean, at, I, at the at cost option at cost, from yeah i, I don't yeah. I, I don't make a, i don't make a dime from those I, I will i hopefully will make something when we start selling them but for backers it's at cost everything so it's a, you you back the 15 euros and and that's it you get the book and, and all the cards and all the stretch calls. The, the zine that is coming to it was another stretch call. It, it is also at cost. So yeah, your guys are getting everything at cost. But yeah, going back to, to the board game thing, uh, with the cards, you basically don't need the, the book. I mean, you can just have the, the cards, the different decks, and and be there with your dungeon generation stuff. So yeah. So it's, yeah. So you're kind of turning it into a card-based dungeon crawl at that yeah. point, then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's well, awesome. You, st you you still need your your character sheet. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. But but that's it. That's basically. That's it. great. I love yeah. I love the quality of drive through RPGs cards. Um, yeah, they're very good. That was very very impressive. It's excellent. It's very good it's cards. Like, they're not expensive. Um, yeah. There's really no. I mean, I don't as a as a consumer, as a as a customer, I have no issues with drive through RPG at yeah, all. I are, think they're fantastic. They're perfectly. I mean, as good as any other board game I have, uh, like the I don't know or the Magic: The Gathering. Even I mean, it's very yeah. good quality. Yeah. Do you do you like them? Do you find it uh, easy to work with them as a as a creator? Oh yeah, it's they're yeah. wonderful. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Uh, some of the back end stuff it's a little bit uh confusing it's I mean, kind not, of archaic to, i've heard yeah yeah, yeah yeah not to the point not not like backer kid which is just hell it's that's just <laughs> it's it's a fucking nightmare sorry mm -hmm. i don't know if i can swear that's um, all right <laughs> as long as it's so, not within the first seven minutes <laughs> so yeah but uh they they are super friendly very 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 helpful the, you have a problem and they answer you in, immediately I, I it's i'm i'm oh, actually wow. very i'm very impressed with how well they work and also from as a customer because i i'm a huge customer i mean i would say at least 60 percent of all the books i owe are pod's from I, have, I bought so <laughs> much stuff from them yeah it, it's just nuts <laughs> it's nuts uh, because be, be, uh, since i'm forced to order proofs to be able to to sell my my games. I mean, when I put up uh, upload my files to Drive Through RPG, in order for you to be able to actually sell them, of course they demand that you see the product you're what getting. What it looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have to order a proof, and of course I'm always like, ah, it's just spending 16 euros in shipping just for one book. That's silly. I'm going to order this and this. 
So yeah, and always, a whole bunch of other stuff along with yeah. your own uh, with your yeah, own. Yeah, so I, I yeah, always yeah. end up with uh, a thousand books here. So, but yeah, the quality is amazing, and and the and working with them as a customer and and as a publisher, it's super easy. So I'm I'm really That's happy. Great. With That's it. great that they have good customer service on both ends. I know Ga yeah. Game Crafter does too as well. I've had some problems with Game Crafter, and I've contacted them and. And, I uh, wish it's, they it's, came to Europe. That I know, so and I keep. I, so I've got kind of a, a a rep that I interact with at Game Crafter a lot. You know, yeah. I um for to get preview uh, uh, copies of, of their games, and I I talk to him at least a couple times a year. I was like, man, you guys have got to get some European distribution because there are a lot of people. Who would buy so many more of your games if you guys yeah, if it will, wasn't for they the will shipping? They make a lot of money. I just, I, yeah, know. man, I know. And there's so many games that I don't get because the shipping is just not well. It's not only the shipping, of course, it's the shipping and customs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if they if they got a, a production plant here in Europe, it will be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> not for my wallet, but it was very cool. <laughs> yeah, I know because I there's a quite a few people from outside of the United States who who watch uh, the dungeon dive and and uh, I hear that a lot I'm like oh, man when is this you know when are they going to have worldwide distribution and but I don't know yeah you you know better than a lot of people how just insane worldwide distribution is right now as far yeah, as but, prices and logistics oh yeah, and stuff it's it's, it's, it's just getting worse and worse it's yeah. getting really really bad so which will also make things easier. I mean, one one of the reasons to avoid uh, shipping, I mean, uh, uh, purchasing stuff uh, outside of the European Union is, is because it's just madness between the increased costs and and to see if you actually get your package, how is in which condition is going to arrive. I mean, the the closer it is, the, the bigger chances you have of getting your your game in in good condition and at an affordable price. So yeah, that. That should be for them also an incentive for to open a plant here, but I guess it's I don't know. Well, they they know their business because they seem yeah, to can't. They, they they probably just don't see it in the numbers, you know. I mean, yeah, the, the the twenty or thirty people that ask me all the time that's that's not enough to make that's not enough to make a difference. Yeah, yeah. to their to their bottom line. Yeah, but uh, so so uh, you focus. You do a lot of uh, print on demand. And I think everything you've done has been uh, released uh, as a PDF as well. Yeah, um, at least PDF. You, yeah. Yeah. Do you find do you find a big discrepancy between people who only want digital and who only want um, physical, or is it like fifty fifty, or do most people want physical? What What do you see as a creator? Um, I would say it's it's kind of split. I mean, the more old fashioned, old school people like myself always prefer to have a physical book. Even though the space <laughs> is That's, starting to be yeah. a, a limit, <laughs> it's, a, yep. it's a limiting factor. So it's it's getting to that point where if something comes in, something has to come out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. They, definitely the the younger generations and all that they 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 go for digital. I would say, even though of course you have people, you have older people who get digital only, and you have younger people who get only physical. But yeah, I would say it's a good split. So I'm I'm happy providing both. Yeah, I finally got a pretty good. It's an it's an okay uh, inkwell printer at my house, and so I've been yeah I print a lot of zines now because I just like you know it's it's impossible to keep up with all of the zines and stuff on Kickstarter, and I'm always missing the physical editions. But yeah, I can print pretty nice things at home now and and yeah, bind them see with that? the. That's yeah, something that surprised it's... me because I that's something initially I didn't account for. I didn't imagine people would be printing because I actually had people contacting me saying, I don't have a printer. How do I get the character sheet? I said, it's just, I don't know, go to the, <laughs> go to the library. Go to... Yeah, I don't yeah. know. It's, it's I, not having at least a printer. It's just for me, I always, always, my whole life, I always had a printer. Uh -huh. So, but not. To the point of, I mean, I guess I'm just lazy, or I never had um, a good quality printer to be able to put out zines myself and to, to put them together. So when I realized how many, many people 
it's a lot of people who get my games on PDF and then they make their own copies. And I was like, oh, wow, that's that's really cool. And, and on top of that, some people make really, really cool. They 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 bind the books. They Yeah, they, hard yeah, covers I mean, and everything. Yeah, yeah the people <laughs> are very, very crafty. So that's always very cool for me. Yeah, it's kind of cool. It's kind of the the uh, the indie gaming people, the market, the consumers are kind of, in a way, keeping old fashioned bookbinding yeah. alive in some ways because all of these games that are only in PDF now, people yeah. want physical copies, so they're learning to stitch their own binding and yeah. put together their signatures and make hard covers. It's 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 yeah, cool. I, it's I, neat. I w I wish I had time for that because I always loved book binding and i always found it so cool but i i just don't have the time to add another hobby to the list <laughs> because that's a hobby on it on it oh, in itself so. huge, yeah i enjoy watching people do that i don't have the yeah. i don't have the patience for it i i'm i'm terrible at cutting things like i just you know, oh I'll, no I'll, people I'll make... <laughs> buy their own industrial uh, cutters and guillotines yeah. and everything i think they're just like going full in uh -huh. so, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's pretty neat. Well, hey, let's talk about some games, and we'll start yeah. with uh, at the kind of the beginning here. I think is uh, with uh, Disciples of Bone and Shadow, and this is the um, Conquered Sun edition. So, I think originally this was put out in kind of a series of zines, right? Well, and not exactly. So, so the first version. Oh, the first, first, first version of Disciples was actually uh, D20 based. Mm -hmm. And this and, is D100 based. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that version, that first edition had, I don't know, we made a very small print run. Well, it was released with Exalted Funeral. I, I don't think we made more than 300 copies of that one. And then I, I can't remember why. I mean, it's been years already, but... Well, I, I I understand why because I prefer D hundred systems always, but I, I so I turned it into a D one hundred system, and and it was also just the basically the same small book, just D one hundred uh, version, and shortly after I released the first expansion, the narrative playbook. But um, it was first released as PDF, but since Exalt the Funeral never. Uh, really got around releasing it physically. We were going to organize a Kickstarter and all that, but at the end, it just never, didn't happen. So I decided to take the the expansion and the core book and just put it all together, add a couple of changes and new things, new illustrations, new layout. And that was the Conquered Sun edition, which initially I released myself uh, as a deluxe version. And and then uh, Exalted Funeral released that, that one you're holding in your hands. Yeah. yeah so this this is um this was one of the first kind of i think kind of all-in-one solo rpg style things that i i bought and i I tracked down a copy on ebay but uh for people who aren't aware this is a, it says a brutal world awaits welcome to um is rune the demon world a world of light and darkness of fire and ice where only the ruthless survive with most life concentrated in the narrow stripe of inhabitable land, simply known as the twilight, competition for the few resources left after a devastating cataclysm that left the planet on a synchronous rotation thousands of years ago, leaves no room for anything else but the most basic survival. And that that can kind of sum up a lot of the games that you have made yeah. you like that yeah, kind I'm, of like brood, I'm kind of repetitive. brutal survival uh element yeah i suppose i do yeah i just find it fun the having nothing and then just trying to fight for your survival and 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 exploring and seeing what you find and scavenging and all that i just i just find it fun myself so that's the kind of games i yeah i write like I always say, I write games for myself first and foremost, and then other people enjoyed them. Well, that's just a yeah, bonus. That, but it's yeah. a bonus. Yep. Yeah. Well, also, I think that structuring a game, a solo game in, or structuring a game with that kind of solo or with that survival element in mind, it gives a good framework, a good structure for solo play. Because it, you have 
def definitive things that you're trying to do. You have small yeah. little goals that the player is constantly working towards rather than if you were taking just kind of a basic non-survival style RPG where it's just the world is your oyster. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to worry about the min minutia. That could sometimes be a little harder for the solo player. Yeah, you're right. It lends um, a very structure um, sort of gameplay to to the kind of games I like, which are sandbox, yeah. open world, and all that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it definitely. And it's easy. It's kind of easy for us who maybe spent more time with board games to transfer yeah. over to something that has that kind of that kind of turn structure or that that gives you those little goals that you're working towards rather yeah, than just being able to do whatever you want. You can definitely see that board game DNA on, on most of my games because I tried mm -hmm. to give that structure gameplay like, okay, do the, the step, the step. You, uh, you always have the option of going off rails, which is the the part I like from RPGs. You And it's more difficult with board games. I mean, with board games, you're really tied to the to the rules and the procedures described in, in the rules. And with RPGs, you have the rules and procedures, which are uh, like a strong suggestion of how to do things and in which direction you should be moving. But you can always do as you want. So yeah, without the necessity I... of, of home brewing. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I think your games, or one thing that I notice about a lot of your games is the is the is the uh, time you spend in creating the the world for the player to to live in, and um, is that something that did you grow up reading a lot of a uh, lot of fantasy? Were you into <laughs> into world building? Is that and... a trick question? <laughs> <laughs> was that is that a redundant question yeah yeah it's uh i mean yeah of course i mean one of the first things i remember as a kid being obsessed with tolkien of course uh, like most people in my generation nerds and all that um i basically made my own silmarillion based on my own <laughs> did I you mean, on your own world yeah, yeah. On my own so with and I was like 10, something like that. But I literally, I, I wish I found that book. It's just I moved to too many times, but it was <laughs> with with creation myth and everything. I mean, it was just lore and lore and lore and lore. So yeah, I, I always liked, enjoy, I always enjoyed writing and world building. And and of course, the role-playing games are just the perfect medium to, to not only read about interesting settings, but to live in, in them. To and, live and in do, them, yeah. Yeah, to, to do activities and then so... Um, but usually <clears throat> with most of my games, with Disciples, for example, too, I prefer to the show, don't tell way of, of doing lore, which is less uh, exhibition, like a uh, right exposition, right in your face. There's not big, uh, blocks of, of text and pages and pages explaining you how the world is. And you see it yep. more through, through the people and through the items, the, even the monster, uh, descriptions. I mean, everything has a little bit of lore drops here and there and hints of. So that is that kind of. It has named that kind of uh, world building, but I, I can't remember right now. But yeah, you have the the one which gives you all the info at first, and the one that is more organic, more part of the of the setting itself, which you discover as you play. So you don't need to really study about the world. You just start playing, and you discover it as as you go. And I think it's perfect for for solo gaming. Yeah, I think I would call that probably emergent narrative or yeah. no, I, I think it has, it has environmental storytelling. It has some I, I remember some watching some video, some YouTube video about that. So it, it does have a specific name, but I just can't remember mm -hmm. now. But yeah, it's definitely emergent uh, storytelling and organic. Yeah. Yeah, I gra so I gravitated pretty strongly towards <laughs> disciples on that kind of world level. Um Probably because, you know, back in what well, I think it was like 2010 or so when I fell in love with uh, with like Demon Souls and Dark Souls. And I've always kind of loved from softwares, video games, uh, even back on the PlayStation one era, but how they tell their stories through the discovery yeah, in the world. It's exactly the same. And, yeah, yeah. That's and they were example. super influenced by things like Berserk and yeah. uh, <laughs> and, and, and Black Company and, and yeah. Dark uh dark kind of grim dark western uh western fantasy and so i, I got that i felt that coming from you <laughs> <laughs> definitely in this 
Yeah, that, that's that's definitely my my DNA for this yeah. kind of stuff. Berserk and Black Company, as you mentioned, and of yeah. course more more cock all over the place. I mean, all even though some of his stuff is less well, or, or actually most of his stuff is not really grim dark. Uh, maybe just you could maybe call the world of Elric a little bit kind of grim dark. It's a but, little bit, yeah, yeah, but not um, Corum or. Yeah, or Hawk Moon, all that is Hawk definitely Moon, just yeah. high fantasy. Well, of Corum is more even science fantasy to science, some science, point. Yeah, so, which yeah, almost is, like well, I mean, it's, it's absolutely, it's gorgeous. It's just it, all his world building is absolutely gorgeous. That's it's my favorite author for a reason. So everything he is written, I is just uh, I, I love it. Most yeah, of my games yeah, are love letters to his work great. in in a way or in one way or another. I think my favorite. I mean, my favorite Elric story kind of like a, even like a dying earth type story uh the, the first story in sailor on the seas of fate where he takes that team into that dungeon but the dungeon is obviously some kind of spaceship or something oh yeah yeah they discover yes, yes. all that weird alien yeah. technology man i love that story so yeah, much it's, it's so yeah. good <laughs> it's just so creative and and all the quorum stories i mean i was it was absolutely mind-blowing for me the coming especially from from tolkien in this kind of high fantasy because I, I discovered Tolkien before yeah, Moorcock. Yeah. Even though my father had, actually, that's how I read them. He had the books in his library. So so one day I was like, oh, what? this looks cool. I, I took them and I looked down. This is amazing. But when I discovered Corum, it was like, this is so cool. It's the, And I started actually with the second trilogy. I didn't discover the first one until many years because it was difficult in, in Spain to find anything translated. And everything was, you had to go to flea markets and to find the original books from the 70s and all that and so yeah it was difficult to find everything 70s and 80s and the, and so, in the, uh, the second sorry sorry go ahead no go ahead go ahead go ahead no i was i was just going to say that the second trilogy with uh, corum that blew my mind the fact that he was the one being summoned by others to, yeah. to 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 their aid so for me that was like <laughs> there was so and it was all the melancholy that that you can breathe in the whole story and the whole series actually is the dying of 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 a race and About, and him yeah it's just very melancholic the the whole the whole setting of Corum it's just always uh, very very emotionally deep I, I, I at least that's how I I always understood it yeah that's so, it's it's interesting so growing up you were in Spain and you weren't reading in English learning and, to read in English did you did that open up your like the Actually, availability of fantasy or or do you well, find so, a lot of stuff translated since i was i grew up in the us so english for me was um my i would say my first language even though oh, okay I, okay i can i can when i moved back to i moved back to spain when i was nine years old and and it was like i when i arrived to spain i barely speak, spoke any spanish uh, so but then I had like the switch. I I almost forgot English. Nobody was speaking English, of course. Everything mm -hmm. was in Spanish. Every everything here, the films are dubbed. Everything is yeah. translated. So it was impossible to get your hands. The only books I had in English were the ones from my father in the library and all that. So I kept my English. I mean, I I could still read it perfectly and all that. But if I wanted new books, they had to be in Spanish. They had to be in Spanish. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but fortunately, things started changing with the internet and. I I started ordering books from Amazon UK yeah. back when Amazon was just a bookstore. Just a bookstore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <I> remember. <laughs> so the good old yeah, days. <laughs> yeah, in the in the late nineties. So that's when I was like, oh my god, all these books I always wanted, and now I can order them in English. And it was well, and now I only read in English. So yeah, are there? Are you aware of any really great uh, Spanish authors of, of of fantasy that? that haven't been translated that are kept as a as a as a local secret or anything i'm i'm not the right person to ask about yeah, this. Yeah. I, I have friends who are really really into all that kind of stuff and and really into underground spanish authors and films mm -hmm. and all the fans but me i i i'm i'm always actually most people think i'm from the u.s because since i'm always <laughs> i've been always culture oriented to the u.s because uh -huh. i grew up there and, and all my hobbies i have a lot of friends there i mean my news everything i, I learn about things that happen in spain when i go to the gym and people tell me i mean i it's like i don't live here my, yeah, my whole that. life yeah. is u.s oriented 
So I, I just don't know. <laughs> I, I'm I, always my, curious about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sure I, I could ask a friend who is really into all this and he will give me a list, but, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't, I no, don't know. No, that's fine. I'm trying to remember if I read something in Spanish, it's just on top of that. Most of my Spanish books are not even here with me. They are my mother's place. I know, but, yeah. um, I, I forgot his last name, but, uh, Oscar, the, the designer of, uh, of, of dungeon universalis. Yeah. He's actually written a couple, maybe a series of, uh, Oh, I'll have uh, to fantasy. Check it out then. And, and he's got his whole world and stuff. And I think that's where Dungeon Universalis is 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 set in his his world that that he has created. Yeah, I, but, know, um, I know he has a pre created I, a world in in very detailed setting, but I didn't know yeah. he had uh, any books published. Yeah. Oh, I don't I don't know if out. they ever like I don't know maybe he self published them. I don't know if they were ever actually available. I don't I don't really know too much, but I know he has written um, at least one novel in his world. Even though. Personally, it's a little bit too high fantasy and too yeah. It's a bit too much for me. It's, it's this kind of setting that it's, it's like a Galarium for Pathfinder. It's like everything goes here. I mean, you want orcs here, firearms here, anything. I mean, whatever you can think of, it, it, there's a there's a place for it. And uh, that's not the. I mean, I can I can have fun. I can have fun playing playing those kind of. Actually, I am playing. I started yesterday. A new Pathfinder campaign as a player, so I can have fun in that kind of settings, but it's not my preferred kind of right uh, of of literature or or games. Is I prefer things a little bit more low fantasy, low magic, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's go to something completely different. So a follow up to Disciples of Bone and Shadow, which was kind of a dark fantasy survival, so, so kind of almost like a fantasy horror world survival into Seekers Beyond the Threshold. And uh, this you can yeah, still get from <laughs> Drive Through. I bought this um, this paperback from Drive Through, and this is kind of your take. I would say maybe your take on something like a Call of Cthulhu RPG or something more more mythos related it's a uh, kind of a uh, secret societies who are out there investigating um it is a little bit unique in the sense that it's a contemporary setting which i don't have you worked in a contemporary setting other than this uh, um, you could say that under ashen skies is, is contemporary the, is it okay yeah it, it, is. it is i mean it has firearms it's you're supposed to be uh in the real world it's just things are not as they seem, but yeah, let's say it is the con it's a contemporary setting, yeah. Yeah, so this says uh, real quick that the world is not what it seems. So this reminds me a little bit also of a of a card game that I just uh, reviewed called Apocrypha. And uh, also for yeah. people who might remember a, an old MMO called Secret World, which is kind of, kind of like this, but uh, it says that behind the, the busyness of modern life, uh, lies a wider, deeper, and frightening truth. Our materialistic way of life carried on the shoulders of the Industrial Revolution brought humanity in existence devoid of meaning and essence, teaching us to live in the moment and worry about tomorrow if it comes. So again, there is this kind of desperate kind of uh, striving for survival in this world as as the characters discover secrets and investigate but uh, what was what was kind of the uh, main uh, inspiration or, or or background for uh, Seekers Beyond the Shre the Threshold the Shroud the Shroud not Threshold? I'm thinking of Lovecraft with Threshold. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, definitely all the um, Lovecraft mythos are uh, always a big influence in in most of my works. But for this game, not only that, I, I would say the number one influence will be something like Cult uh, the the RPG from the Swedish one from the, from the nineties. Well, I, th I mean, I there's a new, you don't know cult. No. Oh, mm -hmm. oh that's a, that's a, I, I, there's a fourth edition now. Um, who published it? I know free league is distributing it, but I don't know if they are, oh, are the they? Publishers okay. as well. Uh, but is there a, yeah, there's an English, there's an English version now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. I mean, I'll the, check the it thing out. is that the, the last, the last edition is, is powered by the apocalypse which is not my cup of tea as a rule set so i have no yeah. idea I, I have the first edition which it just blew my mind completely is it was 
it's this kind of uh, occult based uh, RPG where you discover it's strongly influenced by uh, a Jewish mysticism and 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 also hell <laughs> Hellraiser. So you discover this world, secret world behind the 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 actual world with demons and angels uh, and all this Sephiroth controlling and manipulating humanity, how you are trapped basically. So yeah, Cult is just it was one of my my favorite games ever. When I when I grabbed a copy when I was like fifteen when I discovered that game, something like that, ninety five. It really blew my mind and, and it left a, a mark. It definitely um pushed me into the person I am today. That's how influential oh, interesting. for me. That, wow. Yeah, Very was, influential. Yeah, it was absolutely crucial for me. It really got me into occult stuff and all that. So it's yeah, you and, have a quote I, here from Aleister Crowley opening this up. So so are you so have you been kind of a are you an amateur student of the occult? Have you have you read a lot of occult literature? Yeah, and, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More more than amateur amateur. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really it's it's one of my big passions. Yeah. And and actually everything you read in, in that game, it's one hundred percent based on real I mean, yeah, real, 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 stuff, yeah. real, yeah, it's all based on real stuff, everything, absolutely, all the names you find, all the methodology, everything, it's, it's based on real stuff. So that's, that's cool. What I bet I a lot to... of it probably went over my head. I think my, my, I have a very elementary basis for my, my occult knowledge, mainly coming from things like Robert Anton Wilson and, uh, and anything that Robert Anton Wilson spoke about is kind of like where I stop. But um, I recently bought the uh, Hermetic, the, the book for the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought that was just a really interesting book. But uh, but yeah, yeah that's no, cool. All, so, all that stuff is cool. Yeah. So you based a lot of this on your readings of, of, of occult, of, of occult yeah, yeah. literature. It's, it's 100% it's based on all that stuff. And yeah, I had a lot of fun designing that game because I could put two of my passions together. Together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and on top of that is fully solvable. So the thing is that you are this lonely person that discovers that the world is not uh, as it seems. You are thrown into this um, occult um, world without knowing what's going on. So you discover this secret gathering spot called the Omphalos. Which yep. is in this? Um, it's in London. The, the game takes place in London, so in the underground in London, you discover this this spot yeah, where like the that. yeah the art is amazing. The art is completely based on the style you can find in Vampire: The Gathering and all this nineties. It's completely nineties. The nineties RPG, yeah, the nineties kind of a uh, uh, not triple A but kind of a double A RPG yeah. book out there, yeah. Yeah, so the aesthetics and everything, and the feeling is is like um, this is a complete '90s game, uh, Secret Beyond the Shroud. Yeah, what I really liked about it, what what stood out to me is the uh, is the locations, and so as the players go out to investigate these uh, these locations, each of the major locations has its own chapter. Like we have the abandoned complex, and so. When a player goes to the abandoned complex, you have a D20 chart for events. Then you have a D20 chart for discoveries. And you kind of have a, again, it's like this really nice structure for the solo player to go through these investigations. And it gives us a, a it gives us a, a direction to push for. Yeah. And I really liked that. It's a, it's a, it's a neat, it's a neat book. I like this idea a lot. I like this setting a lot. I thought it was really cool. Um, one yeah. thing it reminded me of is um, one of my favorite fantasy books is is a Magica by Clive Barker. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just I love. Yes, that. Uh, now that you mention it, yeah, <laughs> I, I can see. And just yeah. these different kind of worlds that, and like yes, some yes, people yes. are clued into the worlds and some people aren't. But yeah. uh, but now this one also had a follow up that is very hard to get. Um, if you're good at using Google, you can find you can find the um, Nuktemeron. No, uh, Nuktemeron, yeah, yeah, Nuktemeron. Yeah, the the book of the the book of the night. I think it means. So um, yeah, so I've actually this is kind of unavailable, but I found this. If you guys just go to not, Google, 
you can it's find not it. even available uh, on pdf at exalted funeral they, they removed it from there too i haven't se- i didn't see it there um, was it available there maybe i didn't yeah, have to go search for it yeah it, it originally was there i don't know i don't know what they've done with it <laughs> so you yeah, so these two books were originally were from exalted funeral yeah and uh, i know uh, people if you want like i know that this maybe won't work but if you want to see more of seekers beyond the shroud and more from disciples uh email exalted funeral and bug them because uh, they're sitting on some stuff that that we want to see released (laughs) yeah there's uh one whole expansion for disciples and Mm -hmm. two zines completely written and done right laid out and everything huh with art everything yeah and and one whole expansion for for um for seekers beyond the shroud and another zine Oh yeah, now that you mention it, I, I released apart from those two there, I released a small zine adventure, which was only available as a sprint on demand in PDF on, on Drive Through RPG, uh, which was called Trees Are People Too. It was like a weird investigation. You went to some small town in Maine and yeah, weird stuff was happening there. So Exalt Funeral also has it. They could release it. I mean, that that was published, so they could just click the button and they could click the button and and, 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 and republish have it, out. it. Yeah. So yeah, they definitely have a lot of stuff, and, and it sucks they are not releasing the the expansion for Seekers Beyond the Shroud because it really made the game into an actual proper RPG. It added because the problem with the core book it was that you basically had to resolve everything <laughs> through violence. You just yeah, went he, to, it was basically just a dungeon crawler. So you had yeah, to go yeah. to, you went to this or that other the place. Sides. And, yeah, you had a lot of different missions, but they essentially all boil down to go there and kill these people or go here, rescue this guy. But if they give you a problem, kill these people. So get this item. But if they see you, kill them. So <laughs> <laughs> If they so move, the exp- shoot them. Yep. <laughs> yeah. The expansion added the... Uh, alternatives to doing things. I mean, it had the proper investigation rules, um, proper oracle tables, and a lot of different methodology to to expand the game and and play it more like an RPG. So, I really wish they they released. They, I also include a new type of magic, which was more in the style of Ars Mag- uh, Magica, the Magica. I don't know how you say it right now in English. Uh, well, you know the Magica. The, 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 Magica is yeah. how I've always heard it. Yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah, which is you have this bunch of words and you put them together like nouns and adjectives and you put them together and that's how you create the effect. So that nice. that's sort of or like in Rogueland, uh, you know this small the, 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 yep. Yeah, that kind of you take a couple of words, you put them together and which is free now by the way. Yeah, I've got Rogueland right behind me. I'm going to probably be doing a video on that in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah, it, Rogueland it became, is awesome. Yeah, it's I love it's that really, that little book yeah. is so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good, yeah. And yeah, like I was saying, he made it free, completely free. Up, uh, so everybody should grab it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it's, it's such a fantastic book. So much good information. And it's it's not specifically made for solo, but it's so easy, it's to, so easy to turn to, anything yeah. into solo these days. So yeah. Uh, and so especially that great. one. That one is yeah. very solo friendly. Yeah. And speaking of things that weren't um, originally made for solo, we have... This is probably, I think this was the first of the new things, because I think I had I had discovered you through Disciples and kind of went back and got some older stuff. But um, Sacrifice was the first kind of new thing that I, I backed from you. And um, Sacrifice, when I read this, I was like, okay, this guy, Alex T, really likes uh, Black Company. <laughs> and berserk a lot this is what i was like oh yeah okay i see i, I see what this guy is doing and i i approve <laughs> yeah that one is completely but you could say it's a ripoff of berserk and like and, and even more so with the stuff i'm planning to add to make it more like black company which is a mercenary rules and and this kind of stuff i want to and mass come but I, I i really want to add that in in the next release so yeah those two things are the the bloodline for sacrifice. So here, yeah, we call, or you call this as an incense and iron RPG. And this is kind of a big, it's almost like you are playing a, a small part in a bigger conflict that's going on in this world. There's a lot of, 
A lot of war bands are out in the world fighting over these territories and the player is kind of playing these uh, these mercenaries who who are out there and just trying to survive, trying to kind of game the system while other people are fighting. And the players are kind of aware of of uh, of demonic powers that they can see and they they can fight because of their their special abilities. But it's yeah. also one thing I like, and I, I think I said this in my review, is there's and some people complained about it, but there's no magic at, 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 at all. And I always talk about how I don't like, I never play magic users and so I know, I know. <laughs> many pages in every RPG are devoted to spells. Yeah, the, the, so the PC books like, must be yeah. very maddening for you because it's like... <laughs> yes. Yeah, DCC is like, that many pages uh, and that yeah, much of it is 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 magic. So, well, yeah. I don't need 60% of this book to play the game <laughs> that I want to play. So, yeah, I was like, yes, a book with no magic. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Which has actually been just solved this week because I released the new, the new the latest demonic zine, which has the first playable See, now, That's caster. cool because that's yeah, it's, it doesn't take up these pages. It takes up yeah. extra pages, so that's fine. <laughs> Yeah. One of the things, my favorite thing about Sacrifice was, and it was expanded. So, so Sacrifice has been expanded quite a bit. We have the Companion, we have Chronicles, we have uh, Demonic Volume 1. And I've got a whole bunch of different copies of these because I think <laughs> some of my copies are from drive through some are from Amazon. And then, um, who was it? Uh, was it LF, LSO? LF. LFOSR, yeah, yes, Leo, yes. yeah. He so, released that version, yeah. So they put um, a big the first edition, the first, the first version, edition, yeah. yeah. And um, and that's a really nice with like a, a a really nice cover. And then we also put out recently, or you put out the the branded edition, yeah. And this is kind of like the almost like a complete edition, which has kind of like the first expansion stuff in here. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things I, I would like to hear you talk about a little bit for this one is is one of my favorite things is kind of that sentient weapon idea and how the weapons gain power and your weapon is the source of your power kind of and how it can learn all of these abilities and stuff. I thought that was really, really cool. Yeah, so I, I just always loved because of Morcock and <laughs> Stormbringer, obviously. I always loved that idea of a sentient, really powerful weapon. And on top of that, um, the source material for for Sacrifice, which is Berserk, like I always say, this is just Berserk with a mm -hmm. number, <laughs> serious number file off. So there, the character is like his weapons also start to become able of damaging magic and demonic creatures because they start to absorb after killing so many demonic creatures and supernatural creatures, they start to absorb um, part of their essence, the, the, his weapons. So I just said, okay, this is a very cool idea. Let's just put it into the RPG and that's it. I mean, each time you, you kill a supernatural being, you take a little shard, the, the, your weapon draws a little bit uh, of, of the, the creature's spirit. And and when it reaches certain thresholds, well, at the first threshold it awakens and it gains uh, certain powers and all that. But of course, like I always do, it everything is randomized. I love random t uh, tables. So it, yeah, each there's... time you reach a, a different threshold, you your weapon uh, awakens different powers, and and that's the the way I I I decided it was a cool way to add a little bit of supernatural abilities uh, to your character without necessarily yeah. being a mage or yeah like that. yeah yeah so like when your weapon levels up you have a d20 table that you can enhance your weapon trait with different yeah. powers such as command or disciple of flame uh, hidden yeah. hunter inner strength and i just i love that idea so much it it um getting a getting a cool weapon in a game is always fun yeah. but it's always more <laughs> fun when you can 
when you can make that make it personal you know personify it and, and make it yeah. yours and yeah that's and, that's something you know, i always really really loved yeah. and, and everybody has game. a sword but your sword is like a special sword yeah yes the game i'm working on right now one of the things i really want to emphasize is also is that okay you get this weapon and it's going to be with you for if you want for the rest of your journey you are going to be upgrading it and it's going to become like your companion yeah so yeah, yeah that's something i really i really enjoy it's really cool. now two two tables that are ubiquitous in the realms of black oath entertainment are your 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 keyword tables here yeah we have we have your your actions and your theme and i think these are so popular that i think even devra from from geek gamers might have um, yeah, no, she uh, took um, not not those ones. Um, I can't remember. Yeah, she she added for her book for the yeah. her amazing book, which I have, oh, well, somewhere here. <laughs> yeah, she did uh, write me. So I I like uh, these tables a lot. I use them quite often. Can I add them to my book? And I said, yeah, of course. That's that's amazing. I mean, coming from a person which I always admire, like like Deborah, I always loved her work. Definitely, you and and her channel were always definitely a big influence in, in why I decided to start writing uh, solo stuff. So, but yeah, she, she approached me and, but she just can't remember. It wasn't those two tables. It was, it was from Disciples actually. Okay. It's from Disciples. It was from Disciples of One and Shadow. Yes. And maybe it was some NPC stuff. I, I can remember. Sorry. But yeah, okay. she, but you she give, took so, a couple. So a lot of your work is under the Creative Commons um, Attribution 4.0. And yeah, you say that you are free to share and adapt this material for any purpose, as long as you give attribution. Yeah. And I think a lot of indie creators follow that kind of uh, follow that kind of guideline. And you do reuse a lot of things from one game to the next. And I think that kind of follows yeah. under the philosophy of you don't need to reinvent the wheel every time you make a car, right? So if you have something yeah. that works in one game, just yeah. take that and repurpose it for something else. Yeah. I mean, I do reinvent a lot of stuff, but the core mechanics for most of my oracles and definitely those two tables mm -hmm. and the core oracle uh, mechanic, yeah, I, that maybe I tweak a little bit here and there for this or that game. But since I wrote them for uh, for Disciples of One and Shadow, they, they have remained basically the same. Yeah. And, and on nope. top of that, I I have um, uh, used those same rules and that same skeleton of solo rules for for other people. Which, for example, uh, the solo rules of um, Scorch uh, Scorn of the Scorch Lords, the this uh, old school essentials uh, third party book, which was kind of Mad Max uh, Dark Sun setting, very mm -hmm. cool. Uh, well, the solo rules there, uh, they are, I wrote them and, and because they, they asked me, they were releasing a solo, they had a stretch call, which was a solo mode, which was, it was fine, but it was like, uh, yeah, this is, this is cute, but it's like, I, I know me as a solo player, that's not what I'm looking for. Yeah. And I said, yeah. you should do this, 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 and this. And they and they said, okay, we have no idea how to do that. Can you do it for us? <laughs> Can you do it for us? <laughs> yeah. And I said, oh, look, just take these rules. Well, I, and, and at the end, I did it. I took the stuff I had for disciples and adapted it for for their game. But and I, I've done that a few times. Alan Barr, for example, he he uses most of my solo uh, rules too. He he now he's now adapted them and and really made made them his own. But originally, um, I don't know if sacrifice was precisely one of his first contacts with uh, solo games and i know he's been using the those those rules in instead of his games so yeah yeah I, I think it's amazing that people want to to use my stuff it's one of the cool. things that i really liked about sacrifice also and that was in the solo rules was the kind of simple ai that you added for the for the combat to where different enemies if they're melee or 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 ranged or or uh combination they have a, an easy chart that you can roll on to determine some uh, different things that they might do yeah when, you when see that that's combat. one of those things that i that i do reinvent all the time <laughs> because i'm never completely satisfied so sometimes i do it like that and sacrifice lately what i'm doing and i think i and i preferred 
is going the like um, Forbidden Lands, uh, the route of each uh, monster has its own action table. And that's what I did with Rift Breakers. It's what I did with uh, Kernethalas. I mean, it's I like that uh, instead of having to do, because for a solo player, personally, I think that the less the, the least time you less time you spend deciding what happens or what an yeah. NPC is doing, the the better. I mean, yeah. I prefer to play uh, solo games as a player, not as not as a GM. So that takes one decision less out of your hands. It's like, okay, what does the enemy do? You just roll and see what they do, and and makes it much easier. So I'm always tweaking those those kind of uh, AI rules. I did the same for uh, Warlord Ascendant. I'm there. Yeah. I wrote a different kind of AI rule. So yeah, I'm I, I'm never satisfied 100. percent But well, I'll get there, I suppose. Yeah, I can just keep tweaking. Yeah, that that's how I like yeah. to play too. I I think I had a conversation with somebody where uh, we kind of determined that I like to I like to react to things. Like yeah, you said, exactly. you don't like you like yes. playing as the player, so you like to react yeah. to random things. So yeah, exactly. that's yeah. why I like randomness in my games, yeah. was because something completely out of the blue comes, and then it's up to me to figure out, okay, now how do I Yeah, how and does how my character matches, get over that? How it matches yeah. your story. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a fun part of playing solo, if yeah. you ask me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the more I mean, that's one of the things I think when I when I originally saw saw disciples was all of the random tables i was like yes okay <laughs> these random tables are yeah, so wait great. until you see um because i know you don't have your, the copy of uh, across a thousand day worlds but everybody say oh my god this book is enormous it's 450 pages and then i said the rules are 20 pages the rest is just random tools random tables random tables, tools, random tools yes. random, yeah <laughs> you can take this book and use it with any other sci-fi game because it's mostly it's, most of it is just a gender neutral, I mean, gender neutral, <laughs> gender, <laughs> gender political, neutral. not to get too political here, but our yeah. tables are gender neutral here. So yeah, yeah that, no. that too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. Yeah. System neutral. Yeah. System neutral. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so what, system neutral stuff. Yeah. So you, you say you like the D100 system, your first two things were D100 and then bam, you come out with sacrifice and you drop a, you drop a D20 system on us. What, uh, what prompted that? That changed so, for sacrifice. Yeah, that was like um it was me trying new things because up until sacrifice, a uh, game took me basically years to finish. Mm -hmm. It was a very meticulous and, and detailed process because I was also writing the the rules from scratch. But sacrifice, I mean I I'm I'm I must admit I'm not a big fan of D twenty systems. I'm I mean, yeah, I, I mostly played Dungeons and Dragons, but if you ask me, I don't know why. It's, <laughs> it's just because it's there, because everybody yeah, plays it, right? because, it's just, yeah, it's because easy. Every, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my 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 group plays it. Even though I'm generally the GM, I've been GM for 20, 30 years. Uh, only recently I started playing again after literally decades of just being the GM. But still, I always end up running some D&D &D style. So I had all this bunch of home roles. Mm -hmm. and 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 i just decided that, okay i have all this stuff it's pretty cool this is the way i play any dungeons and dragons style of game especially advanced dungeons and dragons the second edition which is the one i, I started with and i just took all that added a little bit a couple of elements from fifth edition which i liked because for me fifth edition i mean i mean i know everybody hates it and all that but since i never liked dungeons and dragons i literally went from AD&D second edition to fifth edition. I mean, all I I skipped third edition, three point five. I skipped fourth. I just didn't know they existed. I mean, I knew they existed, but I just didn't care. And and fifth edition, the first time I played it was two years ago. So yeah, it's just Dungeons and Dragons was never really that. I mean, the the new. And then I came to fifth edition. I said, actually, this is not so bad. I, there's a couple of cool ideas. So I took a uh, the couple of things that I enjoyed for it. From it and and that's how sacrifice appear i i said okay the, uh, let's try to make something more osr uh, people really seem to enjoy it i enjoy it even though it's not my preferred rule set and and i wrote it like i said in a month it was done since i had all my homebrew rules already and and i had a very clear idea of what i wanted for the setting after after reading berserk 
I, I got sick. I didn't have anything better to do. And I read the whole Berserk <laughs> from the beginning did you read, again did you read every yeah you read everything the whole verse and in two weeks or something like that i mean everything years and years of berserk in two weeks <laughs> and and i ended up like i have to make a game it's just yeah. i have to and a month later we had sacrifice no so, that's yeah. cool yeah i i'm i have probably played D more than well maybe actually my my system of choice when i was growing up was palladium and nobody likes palladium anymore but uh i never played, played it actually. we played um teenage mutant ninja turtles um and after the bomb and robotech and so those were our games yeah. but um so i played D, D as a kid the red box yeah but i've spent the most time with 5e as far as D, &D goes and it's a perfectly fine i mean it it gets the job done it doesn't yeah. excite me, but it's fun. People are into it, and so yeah, it's um, it's, yeah. it's perfectly serviceable. Yeah, yeah, but, I mean, it, it yeah. But for me, um, I I know you don't like casters, but I generally in the especially in the nineties, I was always playing with casters, and and the invention magic was not not for me. It was not for you. Still, yeah, no, it was just uh, annoying. So when we discovered Rollmaster, it was like, <laughs> why are we going to play this thing when we have Rollmaster? So we we basically just played Rollmaster, and and then later on, well, of course, we I I started with, uh, first with Merp with Middle Earth Roleplaying, then Rollmaster, and af all this after after having played quite a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, of course, the, the second well, the first the the Red Box actually, and then the, the second edition, and then a lot of uh, a World of Darkness stuff, and Call of Cthulhu, of course. So yeah. there was there was Roll Master, World of uh, Darkness, and and Call of Cthulhu. Those three games were the ones I played the most, for sure. Man, uh, Merp had the best uh, critical fumble tables. Yeah, all the critical. Yeah, all well, the Roll Master was that, but to the to the extreme. I, I never played Roll Master, so I guess uh, my my only experience with that would be would be uh, Merp. Uh, but that was always my favorite thing, was just all of those critical tables. Yes, it was yes, so yes. cool. I, I always been chasing chasing that dragon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, because you actually have yeah. I do, so uh, in in sacrifice, you actually introduced a lot of critical tables, and depending on the kind of weapon, if you're using like a blunt weapon or a piercing weapon or a slashing yeah, weapon, they're kind of basic. They are my attempt at making that, but really basic. Actually, some of the un unreleased material for for disciples of Bonenshali in the expansion, there was really huge crit tables in the role master vein oh okay so, cool yeah <laughs> and and the game i'm i'm working on now i'm i'm adding up aside from the just uh, bludgeoning slashing and piercing critical tables i'm adding uh, one for each type of damage so you have cold criticals you have a, a lightning criticals i mean depending on the damage type you're dealing you have you don't specify specific crit table which i i just i oh, find that it so fun. Yeah. yeah i find it very fun <laughs> descriptive and 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 fun to to roll on and it creates stories and like uh, yeah uh, reacting to bad stuff is always fun you know yeah. how do i get i mean you never like in rpgs i i always remember more fondly the bad things that happen to my characters rather than the good things so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, the all the of course all the deaths are always epic and legendary. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. So coming up next, we have uh, a little bit of controversy here. We have God Shard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so God Shard came out, and yeah. two days later, or one day later, it was gone. It was vanished, yeah. and I had done my review, <clears throat> and people were like, "What happened? I'm looking for God Shard." I was like, "I don't know." I, I just got it on Amazon yesterday and then come around. Now it is broken shores. Yeah. So uh, there was a little bit of a trademark. Yeah, I, I just, that was just me <laughs> being dumb, not doing my my research and, and seeing if the name was already in use. And I learned my lesson. It's not happening again. It's, yeah, it was, was a, like a, some like, it was like a Korean MMO or something, right? I, I think it was a bunch of things they were planning on because they had copyrighted everything up with Godster. So they have games, they have 
uh, books. Uh, they have a bunch of other things. I mean, they they really cover their bases, so they they really want to expand. But um, yeah, so that's why I couldn't. I think nothing is actually released. So that's when I did my basic preliminary search. So oh, this is not taking okay. I'm I'm using this name, and of course I didn't look up the the proper. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's important to do. So I work my my day job is uh, is IP law. Yeah, yeah, you and... told me. Yeah. Yeah, and I went to yeah, the for you trademark. must have been so obvious, so obvious. Like, look at this idiot. <laughs> I went to the trademark department and I searched Godshard, and I was like, oh yeah, there's all this. Because uh... like, yeah, when you file a trademark, you want to file it in, in in everything that you think you're going to release that yeah. that that in. And so yeah, there's like games and all kinds of stuff. So, uh, how quickly did it? Did you have to come up with, or or how how did you come up with this Broken Shores name so quickly? And, and well, I had I, I always have a list of of names for because it takes me forever to come up with a name, and I always have this big list, and and Broken Shores was in the list <laughs> below <laughs> below two, God Shores. Right. So I was like, okay, <laughs> number two. Well, <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, so that, this was another kind of survival game. Uh, this one a little bit focuses more on kind of a hex crawl where uh you wake up and the the world has been kind of flooded and there's all there's there's very little land so you're kind of hopping from one little island to the next and your your raft your 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 craft becomes kind of your your base of operations and that was kind of one one of my favorite things of broken shores is how you can upgrade your your craft over time and you can add uh, work benches to it to to craft yeah. things and I also like the character generation part where you kind of come up with your background of, of uh, so you're like a prisoner, right? Of a yeah. cult and yeah. you escape and you have some cool random ch charts on, okay, so what were you able to get escape with? And then I think there's some mechanism where you can kind of push your luck to get a little bit more. Yeah, there are a couple of things where Something bad you can, might happen. Yeah, you can choose to help somebody to to escape and and you risk this but you get that or there's another step where you can where take more stuff but you risk being injured i think you can even lose a hand and things like i can yeah, remember right yeah. now but yeah there so there are a couple of decisions where like okay you can push your luck and get a, an edge if you manage or you are going to be screwed but yeah i, I had fun writing that well i think it was good for the for the setting yeah it's got a good it's got a really good kickoff system and and I know one thing I hear from a lot of people is that if the game is very difficult yeah, to survive. Do you have any do you have any survival tips for people? That's the funny thing because most of the people I, I know one of my patrons, he he says, I, I love your game. This is my favorite game of yours and one of my favorite games ever. But my characters just die after a couple of days because they starve. And I say, and I, I really try to replicate that myself. But I mean I played like I don't know, at least half a dozen games, and I, most of the times, I find a, an island on the first hex, which is stupid because it's a roll of one in a twenty, and that happened to me several times. And the key to survival most of the times is coming across an island on on yeah. time before, because it's the only way of getting a proper source of a reliable source of crafting materials and food and water and all that. Otherwise, you have to really depend on your luck. Uh, but so yeah, the core book is it's is really swingy. If you're lucky like me when I play it, you start amazing and, and you're set off in a moment. And if you're not, you're you're going to be doomed. Which is also funny because this guy I'm I'm telling you about, he wrote uh he was dying so much that they say it's just I'm I'm tired of creating new characters. So he created a really cool character, online character generator. So you just go oh, to the website. Click a and, button and it, yeah, and there yeah. you have a perfectly new character. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny you say that because I think when, uh, in my original playthrough, I put some uh, points in my sailing skill, but I oh, yeah, like I, I never had to roll sailing. Yeah, I remember. And so in my review, I was like, "Well, you know, I I invested points in sailing, but I don't really think you need it." And you were yeah. you were like, "Wait, what? No, no, you must no." Have got really a lot lucky of people with your were, weather were just <laughs> they were just dying in a second because of uh, running into a storm. And their ship will just sink in a moment. That happened to a lot of people. I was thinking, is 
did I make this wrong? And then I saw your review. I was like, okay, this guy had the o completely opposite <laughs> experience. He didn't have to sail at all. So I think that's fine. When you get the two opposite yeah, uh, yeah. experiences, like I think we can call that balance. <laughs> but in any this... case, for people who find it too too difficult, I, I made the, the expansion, which is a good starting point. The I released it last month, something like that, the Egra Stab Reborn. Yeah, I, oh, I, that's actually, right. I, I totally forgot yeah, about that. I, 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 I have to send you the, yet. yeah, I need to yeah. send it to you. I, I completely forgot. That's right. But I have, I have a few things to send it to you, so you'll get it soon. So does that one have kind of an easier, an easier path in, into the introduction of, yes, of the game? because uh, it's directly, it's an island crawl. I mean, it's a hex crawl. It's, yeah, it's 50, it's an island 50 hexes big and you, you are basically hired to clean it up and to see what's going on because it's the, it's the, part of the lost capital of one of the factions you described ah, in the okay. book. Yeah. So you you go there and see what's going on. You and you try to make it level. So it's a very good starting point because you are in land mm -hmm. and you're going to be getting resources. resources. And yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's, a, it's definitely easier. So for people who are struggling, if you start there, uh, once once you clear that that out, uh, you even start with uh, if you're lucky, you can find a god shard. So yeah, it's. So the god shards are kind of the basis of magic. So in this in this uh, game, you brought back magic, but it's a little different. The god you, to cast magic, you need to find these uh, these pieces of a of a fallen god. The gods have been destroyed, and their little fragments are these god shards, and the god shards will allow you to cast uh, to cast spells. Yeah, well, there's actually. I mean, you have the. They are both god shards, but I call the normal regular shards. Which are they function as a as a currency also. You can you can trade with shards, with water, or with just normal coins that you find from the previous world. Um, so with if you if you use one of those smaller shards, that allows you to cast a spell which you must know previously. So you can you can start the character with some spells or or learn spells as you go. But the problem is that magic, since the god of magic is dead, magic is very unstable. So most of the times, when you cast a spell, you are you're screwed. It's very very unlikely that they will cast successfully or not even successfully. I mean, that will actually harm you. You can try to light up a bonfire and and you will <laughs> burn the whole place. So uh, the only way of avoiding that is by spending one of these shards. But aside from those shards, you have the god shards, which are like larger pieces of each god, which when you assimilate one of those, when you uh, absorb it, um, it gives you 100% reliable uh, powers themed after the god you you've you've taken from. So, yeah, those that, that's like the magic that you can really always count on. If you are, but of course they're very lucky to um, you they're very difficult to find. You have to be lucky. It's like the rarest loot. Yeah, so that's what I was saying. In this island, the starting island, you can even find one of those god shards. You're lucky if you find it. I love the exploration in this game. I, I I'm a huge fan of nautical fantasy. I like I like fantasy set in the open in the open seas, and uh, yeah. So you have a lot of really cool charts for exploring the ocean, and then you can find derelict ships, which are these cool little uh, little dungeons. Yeah. And and for me, Broken Shore was kind of what. I think I've talked to you before a little bit how I thought that uh, Disciples of Bone and Shadow was a little bit too robust for me as a player. But I think Broken Shores kind of took what I loved about Disciples and kind of condensed it down into a more manageable game yeah, for it's, me. It's like a more streamlined. It's definitely what I, I always say is the spiritual successor to yeah, Disciples. That's, that's what I I I felt that coming through, I think. And, and that's interesting. Yeah. So did you sit down to... Did that come out organically, or were you purposefully trying to to do something? No, no, like that? it was definitely organically. It was a result of just more years of experience designing mm -hmm. games. Yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah, now that's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see progress. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, it will I, be a bit demoralizing. Yeah, there was just like disciples just has so much, and I get I get the sense that with disciples you were a pretty new creator, and you you threw like everything <laughs> at the game. <laughs> And it has, it has yeah. so much to it, but sometimes it's, for me, it's sometimes it was too much. Yeah. Yeah. It's, maybe it, I, I don't think it's too much. It's just not well organized and not, 
and the procedures are not clear enough. I think yeah. uh, mm -hmm. it's not, it's missing that uh, uh, board game element that we were talking about where that you that have a little structure. bit more structure. Yeah. 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 It's missing a structure, which I really went heavy with. And the next game, I guess we're going to talk about Rift Breakers. Yes, that one so, is the one that has the most board game-like structure, I would say. So Rift Breakers is, if you guys like um, MMOs, I think, and, and like video game RPGs, Rift Breakers is kind of like an MMO on your tabletop. It's a, it's a video game kind of on your tabletop. And this is, it's a fantasy role-playing tabletop game for one or more players. Uh, you take control of a single character and embark on all sorts of adventures. And here you go back to a D100 system. Yeah. And this is, this game is really all about creating a character. You literally go to a quest board or a, an NPC that gives you a quest. You go on that quest, you come back. And you keep doing that. And that's kind of some of my favorite style of, <laughs> of, of gameplay is just that that loop of yeah, that questing basic loop. and adventure, yeah. right? Yeah. I think the really cool thing about this game and talk a little bit about the character creation process, you kind of walk through, it's almost like a narrative um, character creation process. Yeah, I call it the tutorial. It's the tutorial yeah. area. <laughs> it's like tutorial island from like an old yeah, like uh, exactly. MUDs or whatever. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it says thing. it starts off, uh, you open your eyes, the bright light of the sun blinds you momentarily. You look around and you find yourself in an unfamiliar place. So it kind of like walks you through creating a character like you would uh, starting in a, in a tutorial in, in, in a video game. Yeah. And uh, I've always said that my favorite way to, to learn an RPG is through character creation. And so I always like yeah. when a book starts Definitely. with... The character because especially as a solo player you're you're everything you experience should be from the eyes of your character and so yeah. starting that book starting this really strongly in that in that vein i thought was a was a, a really neat idea well thanks and then so there are in in rift breakers what's what's kind of the main goal of the players like what's their overall kind of quest while they're trying to solve the little quests in rift breakers actually it's there's there's none in that sense it's, it's very simplistic it's the same way you will play a world of warcraft whatever why do you uh, play to i mean yeah there's this story in the background things happen all that but you play to to get better, get better gear, mm -hmm. and and fight bigger monsters. So that's that's basically is that is what they call progression fantasy. Progression fantasy, yeah. yeah. Which I just found out. That's a. I mean, I, I I know about that from like a game side, but I just found out like two weeks ago that there's a whole bunch of novels now. Yeah, I discovered them like novels. A, I discovered them like a year ago, and it's like, oh my god, <laughs> these people they speak to me. This is my kind of. <laughs> I, I've been just reading that kind of books for the past year. Yeah, only that, and and so, not one or two. I mean, I'm obsessed. I'm just reading one after the other. I'm reading everything I find in the Kindle bookstore. Uh -huh, I'm reading. Yeah. So, so I yeah, knew about I, lit RPG, but apparently yes. lit RPG is different from progression fantasy, right? Yeah, but it comes from progression fantasy. I mean, it has the same bones, and uh -huh, it just yeah. takes it one step further into RPGs territory but yeah progression fantasy doesn't have to directly have rpg elements but it's definitely about characters becoming more powerful like uh, dragon ball and this kind of thing which are always always been a huge fan of that sort yeah. of shonen manga or naruto all this stuff that the characters just become more powerful well that's it that's that's the goal become more powerful yeah uh, I, that's my favorite kind of campaign is just a character <clears throat> campaign where the whole goal is to get more powerful so you can go on more interesting quests yeah and, and, and see more different places and uh, yeah I, I love that combination of uh, complete freedom for exploration and discovering a huge world huge world while at the same time your char character keeps progressing and, and and being able to do more things and yeah that's that's why i play role playing games yeah that's so that's uh, always a strong element in in all of my games and Rip yep. breakers has a huge a variety of different systems because you have the core system of your of the hearts which are like kind of classes but not really yeah. you, you can have um uh, four different hearts and there are 
20 in the book, if I remember Hearts correctly. Hearts and abilities, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and each heart has a bunch of abilities. But the cool thing is that you those those ones, you don't, don't just get them when you level up. No, you have, are, everything is a loot drop. Everything. Everything in that game drops from a monster you, you kill. There's a lore reason behind it. But, but mechanically, it's like in World of Warcraft, you go, you click on inventory of the monster you just kill, and maybe you get a shoe, <laughs> that magic shoe. Well, that happens here. And there's a reason why, because it's, otherwise it's a bit silly. Um, but yes, also even your abilities are not uh, really innate to you. You need to loot them from 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 your enemies. So that's another drive. You have the drive to uh, improve your own personal uh, um, a range of abilities. You can have a total of it's yeah. So it's a uh, five. Uh, each each heart has fifteen different abilities. But you can only learn five of those. You choose which ones. Yeah, and, and so the character builds are really important. Yeah, I mean, this for game. me, they're yeah. always absolutely yeah. crucial. But in this case, since I think it's not overwhelming because you start with very little. Yeah, and you and you build it as you go. So in 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 there's not this moment like, for example, with Pathfinder or, or with Fifth Edition, you go and it's like, okay, I have all these options. What do I do? All these little details. No, here you have. You choose this and this, and the rest is just fed to you little by little. So you do, you're you never overwhelmed. You you know it's like, okay, I have this option or this one. Okay, this. And then a few steps further, this option or this other one. Okay, this one. And, and like that, you you build your character. And aside, aside from that, you have all the randomly generated uh, gear and loot and magic items. So all, all everything is randomly generated, like in Diablo. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of so, like Diablo on your, on your table. Although... I do feel like you kind of went a little bit out of your wheelhouse in the kind of fantasy this is. Yeah, I mean, just looking at some of the the art, you can tell that's a pretty big uh, shift in in tone. Yeah, uh, this one is my my generic fantasy my attempt at making generic high fantasy. Yeah, completely high. Fan I still didn't have uh, because I, all my games always are human centric. I don't like having other other ancestry species, whatever you want to call it. I like human centric fantasy the, yeah. the most as well. Yeah. So, so here, I mean, your character can, can be, can have non-human appearance. There's a reason for it and it's randomly generated. So remember in Warhammer, well, I, I think you said actually you didn't own the, the last edition of Warhammer fantasy, uh, the, the, the book. I think you didn't, you said you no. didn't own it. Well, in Warhammer, one of the cool things, it's also a human-centric setting, but you, there's a table where you roll, and most of the times you're going to roll a human, but there's a small chance that you will be an elf or a halfling or whatever. Well, here I, I took that same idea. Most of the times you're going to be a, a human, but there's a small chance that you will be something else, something, I don't know, maybe you have horns, or it's never defined like you're an elf or you're a dwarf. No, it's like your character has uh, pink hair. Or your character has horns. Your character has, uh, your character has scales. There are a few tables like that to uh, change a little bit your basic appearance. And of course, it's a, you are playing solo. If you want, you don't have to roll. You can just pick whatever you want. But yeah, yeah. Those basic tables. And they're they're kind of more like I thought the, of them as more like those little kind of cosmetic yeah, elements that you would cosmetic. add in an MMO. Yeah. Like, oh, my character has cat ears because I. I got the little cat ear thing. Yeah, or, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it was really interesting. I I came across actually I came across a an exchange that you had on on Reddit about this game from a a person reviewed it on Reddit, mm -hmm. and they were they were really positive about a lot of the stuff, and then they were really uh, critical on some of the crafting, and some of the expenses of of the loot. Yeah. And and you talked a little bit about about that um have you have you ever thought about going back and and, and changing any of of the the crafting elements or well, I, for me I, when I, I read that i was like well if i ever ran into that problem i would just house rule it <laughs> if i ever thought it wasn't fun but i come from a i'm very pro house ruling to making yeah, game exactly how i want it to be <laughs> that's been my biggest um surprise as a designer 
how much because it's just uh, I'm I'm like I said before I'm I always been the forever GM mm -hmm. so I it's like second nature you don't like something you change it yeah yeah and I thought I assumed that everybody did that so I made a mistake of assuming that and that's my mistake as a designer and and leaving some things a little bit vague or open to interpretation and on purpose because I say okay I this is how I play things I this I think it's irrelevant if it's this way or this other way. So I leave it vague. But a lot, a lot of people really play the games like raw rules of yeah. yeah. So I have a lot. I, that's something I'm learning to to change and to be very precise in how I describe the rules and and how things work. Because I I realize that not everybody's like me. <laughs> that not everybody has that natural inclination that oh, I, I'm not sure how this goes. Okay, I'll just do this. And just you, you move forward. No, a lot of people get stuck there. It's like, how the fuck is this? And yeah. they read it a thousand times. And it's like, I don't understand it. And then they end up writing me, what did you mean here? And I say, oh yeah, okay, I left that. So yeah, that's that's my mistake as a designer and I'm, I'm trying to fix it. But uh, yes, I think some some people actually enjoy having that option to to personalize. And, and that's something I do. Also, going back to to lore, I uh, le I tend to leave a lot of big holes in the lore, mm -hmm. precisely to allow people, since they are solo games, to leave yeah. you room to to write your own version of the lore and your own setting. And and that's also a lot of people <laughs> apparently they don't like. They want very precise, defined lore. So yeah, it's a it's a struggle. I'm I'm there learning. Yeah, for me, as long as I can, as long as I can grasp the core rules of a game, I have no problem yeah. changing anything about. Uh, I, I, about it's not that game. I have a problem. I know I am going to do it. Yes. I mean, it's I don't play games as they're written. Yeah. Never, never, never. I know. I've said that before. I don't think I've ever played a single game I own completely rules as written, one hundred percent. Never, <laughs> never. It's just. It's like why if, if I you know if. You, if I'm liking 80% of a game, I'm not going to let the 20% that I don't like ruin it for me. I'll yeah. just I'll just change that 20% and or yeah, exactly. just not follow it at all. Which, uh, which is how a lot of my games end up uh, being created. I mean, well, I told you about sacrifice. This is a result of me tweaking Dungeons and Dragons to my liking, and and it's yeah. all my house rules and all that. And 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 the same happened recently. Uh, well, I'm a big, big fan of Dungeon Crawl, Crawl Classics. I think it's just amazing. The only thing for me is I I, I really like uh, skill-based games. And as you know, yeah, Dungeon no Crawl Classics doesn't have any skills. And that's something, I, each time I sit to play that game, I start playing it as you're supposed to. And then I was like, oh, it's just, I need skills. So I end <laughs> up writing a skill system for it. And I've done that three times, three different skill systems. <laughs> for for so the at, DCC? Yeah, so at the end, I just decided, look, this is just stupid. I'm going to make uh, my own version of DCC with skills. <laughs> and and I started writing one. At the end, I, I don't think I'm going to publish it because I'm not really satisfied with, with it. Uh, it was a rule system I, I call Skill 20. Mm -hmm. And I, I said I was going to publish it last month. My, my patrons have it, but uh, I don't know. I don't think it's in publishing shape. Not so for now, I'm, I'm keeping it for myself. Yeah, but but yeah, that's the typical thing that I end up whole house ruling so many things that is like okay, well, I have all these house rules. I'm going to publish them. <laughs> yeah, and then which finally, is why I, I'm guessing that's how your game also came to be in a way. Yes, yeah, Land in Peril. Yeah, um, my game came out from from two like really two two core things. One is probably the most important is is table space uh yeah just games are too yeah. big yes. games the yes. boxes are too big the boards are too big everything yeah, is too yeah. big yeah we've and, talked about this before i'm just oh, it's shrinking you know, and shrinking my yeah my games to yeah that's why i love games like uh, legends untold which is just a couple of, it's a huge dungeon uh, crawling experience in a very small format yeah or or iron helm all these kind of things it's just small space big expanding expensive games so yeah yeah and so yeah that was definitely one thing and then just having a lot of a lot of so in like the board game version me as the creator providing a lot of variety and then the mm -hmm. rpg version 
giving the player the tools to have a lot of to to randomly roll up because i think a lot of people when they approach a, a a solo rpg especially people just getting into the hobby and even me being somewhat new to it is that it's hard to come up with the challenges of like what what are the challenges that your player that that your character is facing um and a lot of rule sets don't give you the ability to to generate encounters in like on the fly and you kind of have to think Which about is very them a little maddening bit. as a yeah. solo player and so my whole system for the land and peril rpg is i mean you you can roll up in it, it's kind of a point crawl from one encounter to the next from one challenge to the next and all of those challenges are random and you, know, you roll into so what what's your next challenge is it with an npc is it with the environment or is it against a monster or, or a trap you roll okay it's a it's an environment okay what is the environment it's a it's a, a pit you have to jump over or okay uh, how how hard is it to do uh, it's an easy challenge how many successes do you need so it's just it's almost yeah. more of a dice game in a way because you're rolling a lot of dice and then manipulating the dice to, to overcome that challenge but um you know i'm thinking more in terms of just keeping things really really simple there's no hex crawling there's no map drawing it, it's it's point from one point to the next and uh but yeah yeah you, you, you do definitely design to, to, to release that? it do you know what, how you're going to release it or yeah so my my goal right now is so i was doing the board game first but like you said the logistics of making a board game, having to make all the cards and, and all of that is just, it's a little overwhelming for me. So I'm doing the, I'm going back to doing the RPG first. And um, that is just going to be a, a, a simple zine format and it'll probably just be through drive through. Perfect. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that, I don't. That way I, I can grab a copy. So. Yeah, I don't, that's how I want to do it. I don't even really want to mess with a, a crowdfund. Although people have encouraged me to like, well, you can make a lot of money on a crowdfund. That's probably the best way. But I, I'm not, I don't well, think I'm prepared to to deal with that kind of long term uh, pressure. Yeah. Of a crowdfund. I just want to make the thing and release it, you know. And I, I wouldn't say, at least from my experience, you don't make any money out of it. It's even when it looks like you're making a lot of money, it. It's great because it allows you to not have to pay up front all the mm -hmm. expenses. Yeah. Because otherwise, I mean, most of my games, I release them myself. And yeah. art is very expensive, as yeah. I'm sure you know. So all that has to come from my own pocket. So uh, Kickstarter allows you to, okay, have all this money already. I can hire this artist. And now you you have a really budget and you know how much uh, you have and how, how, how much you need and all that. So yes, in that sense, it's great. But... The money is going to come from the sales after. So uh, Kickstarter is going to be useful for you if you don't want to risk uh, your own cash for yeah. for the initial budgeting because it's it's tough. Yeah. And if you and, and Kickstarter definitely solves Can all help that. that. Yeah. Yeah. But you go into Kickstarter thinking you're going to make money. No, that's not going to happen. It's you rarely make any money. It always between the Kickstarter fees, the taxes. And uh, unexpected stuff, yeah, it's it always ends up definitely not not worth it for the money. It's, yeah, it's a fantastic um, tool for marketing. That's for, for marketing. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and and that's why companies like Free League still use it because they obviously do not need the money. Yeah, and they they do it because it's a it's a marketing. Mar yeah. yeah, and you know, I mean, I kind of have a built-in channel to market my own game exactly, yeah. through yeah. my so through you, the dungeon dive, you know, so. And I, I think I would definitely, I know myself and I know that as soon as there is a, a uh, uh, an expectation uh, and a pressure on me from people who've already paid for the game, I, cr I crack under that kind of pressure. Like I'm, I'm a musician and I've recorded something like 40 albums and released them myself. Yeah. Every single time somebody has said, hey, can you do music for this for me? I, yeah. I can't do it. I it happens the same to me. I had a couple of <laughs> gigs making uh, music for for ads and things like that, and it's like, oh my, this is yeah. shit. What what is this garbage <laughs> I'm making? Yep, <laughs> very very bad. Yeah.
so yeah i would not i would not do well in a, in a crowdfunding environment but um i think the last game we have is i think it's your newest uh warlord ascendant and yeah. this is kind of going back to sacrifice so this is a game set in the sacrifice universe and this is i believe your first uh, uh miniatures uh, skirmish game yeah so the story behind this actually going back to, to i always had a, a bit i mean a huge fan of skirmish games i mean mm -hmm. uh, mordheim i played it you have no idea how many years <laughs> and years we had campaigns uh, literally years playing mordheim and 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 not one two people i mean it was we were i think it was like six seven people playing almost every night for years we, we so played a like, lot was it like a um a rotating yeah, kind a, of tournament or 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 not a tournament but just no, you would rotate each other's uh war bands no, in and out and stuff or no no it was everybody with their own band war band oh, playing we, playing everybody oh, yeah really? we're five or yes we had a huge table we had a friend <laughs> with a huge huge table and we made all the all the terrain ourselves on top of that one of my friends his father his his job was making terrain or oh wow the, the, the typical guy who makes the models they're going to build a new airport how does the airport look and this guy was the one oh, make, so, so for like industrial uh, models and, yeah, and architectural so, models and stuff yeah yeah so yeah. we had all his expertise and so you can't imagine the you, we had a huge wooden cathedral in in ruins we had built i mean we had a huge amount of terrain my friend still has his basement just full of our terrain so yeah That's we had awesome. this huge stable yeah and and we had campaign there for years and years it was i i love mordheim one of my favorite games forever so yes that's when i discovered the work of uh um nordic weasel and with ivan Sorensen. he i was like okay i can play mordheim alone <laughs> this is this is genius it was it was an absolute discovery for me before before he he was before he released his stuff with Modifius, I I was talking with him, and and we actually started uh, working on a um, uh, on a miniature games uh, skirmish games based on his five leagues uh, yep. five, five five leagues from the Borderlands. So, but in the setting of uh, Disciples of Bone and Shadow. So that's actually that's another thing that uh, Exalted Funeral has. They have all that stuff. We didn't we didn't finish it because then uh, the trans the rights transfer happened, and then we just of course oh, we couldn't yeah, continue working right, on it. Right. But since then, I, I always wanted to to release my own skirmish game, and and well, that's how uh, Warlord Ascendant came to be. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think I see. So there was this kind of progression that I've noticed with uh, with the Dungeon Dive community and even the kind of community spaces that we're in online where, you know, a lot of us started with board games and solo uh, dungeon crawls and solo adventure games. And then a lot of us started kind of gravitating into solo RPGs. And then now I also see a lot of us moving into these narrative skirmish games and yeah uh we, we're kind of I all following the, we're all kind of following this path yeah. and that's exactly what i'm doing i love these little skirmish games that are coming out that can be played on a two by two or even a smaller table and i'm playing them without terrain i'm just playing them with battle yeah. mats yeah exactly. and uh they're miniatures agnostic, so you don't have to buy any certain models, whatever things you already have. And all of us have so much yeah, stuff already, we all have right? Boxes and boxes. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that was a priority for me. It's like I need to get away of using all this stuff. I don't need any miniatures. Yeah, we have maps, we have tiles in our games. Yes. We have we have so much stuff that we can repurpose. All we need is yeah. the rules, right? Yeah. Like exactly. we just need the rules. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, and it's wonderful to see so many games now now doing that. And I could, I could swear it was Ivan Sorensen with Nordic Whistle. I think he started this, so himself. I mean, with his huge success, uh, this trend of a uh, uh, system. I mean, I don't. I'm I'm not going to say he was the first one, but definitely he's the one that put solo system agnostic 
a war a war a war ban or skirmish yeah. level game yeah and that's the other the thing map. is, is yeah. allowing solo players now uh, just introducing really simple ai or yeah. ways to generate um scenarios yeah on the fly it's, yeah it's for, for me it's it was an absolute discovery i i always loved like i said mordheim and necromunda also i had a lot of fun playing necromunda we played it less because we always prefer fantasy yeah but but yeah and necromunda was also amazing and when i discovered nordic whistle games i was like oh my god this is just exactly what i wanted and that was actually before uh, i started writing uh, rpgs and before i discovered that you could play rpgs alone so that was part of my journey I actually went from board games, solo board games, to solo skirmish games, and then I discovered and then RPGs. And then, oh, you can actually play RPGs too. <laughs> so yeah, that was my 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 personal journey. But yeah, like you said, now it's like the zeitgeist is, went to <laughs> is right now is the skirmish games, and I think yeah. it's a combination of Ivan's work and and definitely Forbidden Soul, which is Forbidden. It that was my and, that was my entry into it because yeah. it. First of all, it's 100% compatible with all of your Morph Borg stuff that you already have. So everything that you already own is kind of like a little expansion for Forbidden Psalm. Yeah. And Forbidden Psalm was very simple to learn and play, just like Morph Borg was, and uh, easy to expand. And yeah, it was just such a such a neat evolution. But I think I think you've done something a little different here in that oh also it's a work work you could combine you could play out your battles from your rpg session using forbidden yeah. psalm yeah and you can do that with sacrifice you can play yeah. out your your battles if you want to be more tactical but yeah. i think what you did here is you added a hex crawl element to yeah. to this and it's a little i think it's i can definitely see the influences of five leagues but for me, this is a much simpler version, yeah, and one that's a little more accessible. And I just I love that hex crawl system of of uh, you are your war band is moving from one hex to the next, and you have this kind of uh, procedurally generated uh, war uh, land, and each hex you might find like a temple or uh, some kind of fort that needs to be overtaken or defended. And your uh, your your map of your your war territory is kind of constantly expanding. I think that's super cool. Yeah, I I, I don't like playing games. I'm I, I'm not a fan of one shots in general. I I just I don't see the point. I like uh, creating the story and having my character mm -hmm. story or my warband story. But of course, there has to be a reason for it, and at least in a skirmish game. Because just going battle after battle without a reason is just, I don't know, it felt weird to me. So it's like, okay, I have to add this big campaign element. Mm -hmm. And it, and it was a good fit for Sacrifice because you have all this section of the map, the no man's land. The no man's land, In, in yeah. between, that's been uh, contested for 100 years with completely chaotic and uh, no law. So it's it was a perfect place to add this kind of territorial control and and campaign style of gameplay where you just expand your own territory which is something i always enjoy from all kinds of games and it's something i wanted to add uh, to one of my games for, for quite a while so i think this was just the, the perfect excuse to do it yeah no it's and great I think it's uh, fun. yeah i haven't actually i haven't actually played uh, the, a campaign yet but I'm really looking forward to because when i was reading the campaign rules i was like oh man this sound i mean actually I think you could take your the hex crawl rules from this and almost play that like its own little uh, mini game. Yeah, definitely you could. Yes, you can then use uh, any other system if you yeah. want. Yeah, you will, you will have to tweak the the benefits you get from each because of course the yeah. point the point of your band why do they want to have a uh, more territory because each hex uh, yeah. gives some kind of benefit to your war band. We, either you can recruit specific kinds of units or get some uh, unique uh, combat actions or a warehouse, a uh, uh, marketplace. I mean, this kind of small settlements. So yeah, there are advantages for you to gain this territory. So if you want to take that 
campaign system into other game, you'll have to tweak the the rewards, your your warband re rewards. But I don't think it will be very difficult, honestly. Yeah, and another thing I like is you make it very easy to scale up or down the number of models that you put on the battlefield because however models you take in from your warband the enemies get a certain number of models on their side yeah and so if you want to play with only three or four in your warband uh go for it if you want to what like up to like 10 or something yeah is, the, is, the, is that, the, about, is that the, about the max the scale is very small it's from the average you start with uh five but well uh, the inquisition ban i think it starts with four if i remember correctly and the largest is the commoner ban which the commoners, starts with yeah yeah th those ones can have up to 12 I, th I think 12 was the highest if i remember correctly but yeah, yeah it's very small scale because uh also the 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 gameplay area i made it um small because one thing that always annoyed me with with games um, especially thing, even something like Necromunda or or, or or Mordheim, is that okay? You start in this side of the map, and the other ones on the other. And the first fifteen turns is you just, just moving. Yeah. To, to me. So it's yeah. like okay, I'm I'm going to get rid of all that, and and you are yeah. in the fight in two turns. In the, in the second turn, you're already shooting the opponent. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, the the play field is much smaller. So you get to the action much faster. So the game lasts. I mean, on my experience, the game has never lasted more than an hour. So it's it's fast and 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 I think it's it plays quite lightly and fun. Yeah. Yeah, and th that's another great thing about um, Forbidden Psalm is all of the matches are six turns. So I mean, they're just like yeah, set up. You have to do something. You have to do something major on your first turn. And, you know, you don't really have a lot of time to, to mess around. And that's that's what kind of always, you know, whenever I would play, I played 40K a little bit growing yeah. up. It wasn't, I wasn't huge, but I couldn't afford it. I was way too poor yeah. for it. Yeah, so the only way <laughs> but, I could. We would make our models. We would, we would put stuff together. And I would go and I would see these huge, these huge tables with all this terrain, right? Yeah. And it looked so cool. But every battle just ended up with everybody kind of in the middle. Uh, <laughs> rolling buckets of dice and it's like well how come nobody's using this terrain in any yes. interesting way yeah you know it was like it was all just for to look cool yeah i had there was no I, ways to interact with it and... i i played quite a, a bit of a uh, of fantasy of warhammer fantasy which also i couldn't afford but i, I managed to uh, um, exchange most of my magic the gathering collection for a huge elf army <laughs> so i i've played a few years with that and but yeah i was we had this big table and and one was starting one side and, the, and it was like it's just oh why do why don't we start closer so we spend here five hours playing and the first hour is just moving <laughs> yep yeah <laughs> so yeah, yeah it's so... it's more fun when you have it more contained and you have a, what you were saying terrain elements that matter and it becomes a little bit more tactical because you just don't have any other option. You can't, it's like, okay, there's a mountain over there, but I can, I don't have to go there. I can just, we can fight here. The terrain is easier. It doesn't really matter of which terrain elements, but no, when you have a play element, a, a play field, which is just, uh, I don't know, 10 by 10 uh, squares, for example, you, if there's a mountain or a forest there, you are going to be in it, whether yeah. you like it or not. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I like, yeah. I like these new skirmish games that are kind of people are are, are starting to think about uh, people like me who are using uh, loc battle mats yeah. for for their terrain um, and it's like hey yes. you can take two of these books and put them side by side or take one and fold it in half. That's exactly and, what I recommend. Yeah, to you've in, got in your battlefields, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's yeah. how I play tested and actually that's how I play. I remember telling Ivan, uh, sort of, I mean, I was saying, yeah, I play. I know you made it with terrain and minis in mind, but I always play this with tokens and, and battle mm -hmm. mats. That's it. And it plays great. Yeah. And that's how I wrote. Uh, I mean, you can still play Warlord Ascendant with minis and because it's very it's very easy to extrapolate. If you want, you know that one square is it's supposed to be five feet, the traditional, like in Ancient Dragons. So yeah, if you want to be there with your ruler and with no and with an actual terrain, you can do it, but you you really don't have to. You have this small squares like in those lucky battle maps you yeah. you just move and yeah it just works perfectly well yeah yeah that's great 
So, all right. Well, hey, I think we've covered. I think we've covered everything. I think we've gone through most of your catalog. There's a couple things I don't have, but I'm sure we'll get. Maybe we'll come back and touch on those uh, on, on another talk. So, uh, but uh, thanks for taking uh, time today to to talk to talk to uh, me. Thank you for for the opportunity. It's it's been very very fun. I was really looking forward to it. And you've got uh, right now, so people can still late pledge for the the dungeon survival game. And well, not really because I didn't use a pledge manager. Okay. But uh, I I mean it's it's going it's coming to drive through RPG Amazon uh, itch.io and. In a couple of weeks, everything. Okay, have, cool. Yeah, it, I mean, it's almost it's it's basically done. The backers have the the beta files already. It's just missing one illustration at this point. And as soon as I get it, I will upload all the files to to the different platforms. And and that's it. Well, I the deluxe edition, the limited deluxe edition. That one is going to take a little bit longer because yeah, I need to send yeah. the that one is actually printed. I need to send all the files to the the printer and that should be available in March, something like that, I, I think. But most of these copies are are sold already during Kickstarter anyway. I'm just making a hundred of them and I think 70, something like that, they are already pledged for. So I will have a, a few left for the few lucky ones that I want to grab one. But yeah, the, the, the game itself will be available on PDF and print on demand very very soon early early february for sure cool yeah awesome all right alex well uh thanks a lot and thanks everybody for listening and we will talk to you later bye bye